Hello, everyone. Today we are having our online public education summer summit, right? So uh, we're meeting with Superintendent Simpson out of Guthrie Public Schools. He's going to be presenting with us today on working with the board. So very excited about today's presentation. We do these summits periodically. As you know, we have our podcast, the Educational Leadership Podcast. We do interviews, we share stories, but we also, from time to time, have these online summits to have a more focused content that we share with other superintendents and others that are interested in advancing their leadership within public education. So from here, I'm going to hand it over to Superintendent Simpson. Superintendent Simpson, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks, Gary. Appreciate you having me today. And uh, just it's kind of a when you when you asked me to join this, I, I really appreciate that. And I as I thought about what I what's unique about maybe uh, my time in education, especially in the superintendency. One of the things that I felt like was, has become unique is my time at the same school district. Uh, and so that's what I wanted to to kind of go into today. A uh, little bit about me and about um, where I am. Uh, I'm about I'm 34 years in education and mostly in Oklahoma, a little bit in Texas. But uh, for the last uh, 12 years, I've been the superintendent from, uh, for Guthrie, Oklahoma. And what we all know if, in, the, um, in the education field is that the superintendency is a, is a uh, position that is almost a vagabond profession in the sense that uh, people don't uh, stay at one district for very long in many cases. And there's lots of things that, lots of reasons for that, but I wanted to kind of dive into some of the things that I think have allowed me to be uh, successful and stay in the same district for 12 years, because the average tenure in Oklahoma for a superintendent is 3.2 years. And what that, I think the, the negative to that is there are times that it makes it very difficult for long range goals to to really be reached. And so that's kind of why I, I titled the, the presentation working with the board, because the board has to work too, and the superintendent has to work, but the stability of the leadership has allowed us to reach some long range goals that uh, many in our community thought weren't possible uh, really when I was hired. And so that's kind of what I wanted to uh, dive into today. And so I've got a uh, the first thing that I wanted to to kind of cover the basic tenets of what I think are critical to uh, to having that longevity and working and having a great uh, relationship with your board. And the first thing is communication. And uh, and and I'm going to dive into each of these topics individually and how we accomplish them. Uh, the next is trust, and then uh, and then deliverables. Uh, and I think all three of these are are critical, and the board and the superintendent have to work together in order to get these uh, across the finish line. And so that's where, when I put the the statement in there, they are mutually necessary in the sense that both the superintendent and the board have to work on this and have to be willing to work on this to uh, to keep the healthy relationship. And you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. It hasn't, there, there have been moments, uh, especially early in my time when, uh, when maybe we were working on developing the trust and I was learning to be a better communicator and the board was learning to be a better communicator with me. And so uh, we'll dive into these, these basic tenets here. Um, the first on communication. Uh, one of the things that we use <clears throat> to improve and enhance communication is we have committee work by staff and board members and the and I noticed that the the board members are included in these committees and I stole this from my previous district where I was assistant superintendent and it has served us well uh, over the years and the next that we do is we have a, a retreat and board retreat, and we don't go very far. We just kind of go down the road. We have a career tech center that that we go to, and we uh, work to establish norms and goals for our district and for the board relationship. Uh, the next, you've got to be able to communicate with the media. 
and that is uh, that is critical in this day and age. Um, depending on where you are, it may be a local newspaper or a radio station, or where I am. Uh, I found out during my first year that the television stations in Oklahoma City can be in Guthrie uh, very quickly, and uh, usually it's not for something positive. And, and so you have to be prepared for that as well. Uh, then social media, the, uh, the thing that we all, uh, it, it, is a, it is a necessary evil and we can't ignore it. Uh, sadly, it can be very negative, uh, but you can also use that for a positive spin. And that, and that requires a lot of work on, on really everyone's part. And then uh, phone calls with the media, with the uh, with the board members, and and can, if there's something bad, you know, we're going to make sure that we get a phone call to a board member, um, and and I'll talk a little bit about the the what the what the calls would be uh, about, but um, you know, there are emails that can go out, but then there are also phone calls that have to be made where you can have dialogue with the board member about the issue. And then dealing with misinformation, um, that is, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, the misinformation happened at the cafe uh, with uh, community, community members talking about stuff and they hear one thing and or they overhear from the other table or whatever. Now it's on social media where everyone reads it and they look at it and they assume that it's true, especially if it uh, casts a negative light for someone and uh, and things like that. And that's what that's where we really have to to work as a as a group to get out the the correct information in advance of misinformation that is going um, viral or whatever you want to call it. Uh, viral is the is the word of the of the um, social media now. So let's talk a little bit about board committees. We, we established the committees during my first year. And we have three board committees, uh, property, finance, and curriculum. And so the issues that come up for consideration for the board, we try to, to corner the, those issues into one of these three or two of these three, or in some cases, all three of these committees. And they will meet one week prior to the board meeting. And so when, uh, when we look at what we're going to have on the board agenda and what the board is going to discuss, we want to have the committee uh, agenda prepared with those items so that we have a discussion about them prior to the board meeting. We have three board members uh, that attend in our in our district leadership team in Oklahoma. Uh, many of the school boards are five member boards, but in Guthrie we have a seven member board. And I know seven is I think it's the norm in Texas. Um, and then when you look at your your Open Meeting Act um, uh, requirements for uh, a, a quorum in in our case, you'd have to have less than uh, four members to attend. Otherwise, you have to have a posted board meeting. And so we have three board members that attend. And um, and then this is a the next piece of this is a is a real critical thing. A member of our leadership team, but not me, runs the meeting. What I really try to do is I I want our team to shine. And I want the board members to see that and see that we are a team. And so I allow our um, the leadership team to to lead the meeting, run the meeting, and then I interject or answer questions of the board members. And so the the board members are assigned uh, to the committees by the board president. And uh, when you uh, look at uh, and th this is always an interesting thing because it requires the board members to work together. But I coach the board members up and the board president because it's easy for a board member to want to 
to gravitate towards something they're comfortable with. And I encourage them to gravitate away from what they're comfortable with and move toward something where they uh, will get them out of their comfort zone, where they will learn more about the district from a, a perspective. And that way, they become a more um, well-rounded board member. Uh, an example of that, you know, you have a you have a person that um, has an accounting degree, let's say, and because uh, we've had that before, and they want to be on the finance committee because they want to make sure that they can provide the most value to that committee because of their expertise. But while they have that expertise, they're not learning about the challenges that we face in our uh, with our facilities or the challenges that we face in trying to grow our kids through the curriculum committee and the educational uh, initiatives that we've got going on and trying to be innovative with our educational initiatives through the curriculum committee. And so taking that, uh, taking the approach of trying to get um, board members to maybe the first year that they're on the board, find their comfort zone and then move them around where they are on maybe the property committee or maybe the curriculum committee so that by the time the board member has served their entire term, they've served on all three committees. And that way they are well-versed in so many things that we do as, as a district. Um, we get agendas out um, at least a day prior to the meeting with uh, supporting documents. And that may include contracts, that may include uh, proposals for uh, facility modification, that may include examples of um, uh, curriculum initiatives and things that they can take a deep dive into uh, in the committee meeting and things that are going to change. Also, uh, with the finance committee, we have, um, we'll have the entire purchase order register uh, as long and also we place um, uh, things such as we project what our uh, fund balance carryover between fiscal years will be. We start doing that in July for our board meeting or for our I'm sorry for our uh, end of the fiscal year in June, and we we do that really in January. I'm sorry, I think I said July, but that's that's something that we do to try and show that we are forecasting where we're going to be financially, and. The whole goal here, um, you know, you want to make them make the board members comfortable. And it one of the things that I, I really enjoy watching is our leadership team takes the opportunity to show their passion on the areas that they are uh, that they're working in um, our uh, and and show their care for our students with the the various ways that they do their job and the the example of that uh you know our operations director um i've watched him almost tear up at uh in with knowing that some of the things that we did for our facilities helped our kids as he's describing it to our board members and i i think that shows the genuine passion that that everyone on our leadership team brings to the uh to their position and, and to serve our students. Um, this is a key one here. Uh, if you've ever been on a board, and one of the things that I, I share with our board members that I think is an important thing, I've had the privilege of serving on a lot of different boards. Um, I've been on the teacher retirement system board, uh, served as chair of that before, uh, been on the uh, Oklahoma Secondary Schools Activities Association board. Uh, so I have been a board member as well. And so I kind of know what it's like to and what they need to have and what they need to how to make them feel more comfortable. And so I've sat in the in those board meetings where 
I was afraid to ask the quote unquote dumb question. Um, and I want to provide them an opportunity to ask what they think may be a dumb question without any media, without a live stream, uh, without the community members in there. Ask those questions and and trying to convince them that that the two people on either side of them at the table probably are thinking about the same question as well. And those are things that I don't want to take for granted and neither does any of our leadership team uh, because these are things that we deal with every day but are somewhat foreign to the, to a board member because they walk in from their lives and they are now uh, trying to decipher what it's like in education. So providing that medium where they can have the back and forth that is, um, that's a safe space and allows them uh, an opportunity to, to ask those questions where um, it, it helps them feel a lot more comfortable. And, and then the other thing is, and this is, this is a big part of the communication. It allows the board members to share input from the community that they've received as well. You know, if you've, um, being a board member is a challenge because you walk into the grocery store and the people that see you and know you assume that you know everything about the school district and that you're an expert. And so providing them an opportunity to share what they've heard, as well as try to inform them of the things that are going on, uh, to create a, an air of them being an expert uh, on these things. And, you know, there are times that they will tell us some challenging things that we need to know and things that are going on in our community. Um, Here's the here's the thing that I I've got as the goal. When our board members go into a board meeting, I want them to be completely informed about all the items on the agenda. So we've talked about these things. We've done it a week in advance. If a burning question comes up between the committee meeting and the board meeting, uh, they know to pick up the phone or shoot me an email or shoot one of our leadership team members an, an email to ask the question. And and it may be that we need to uh, research the answer because we may not have the answer. This is uh, when when I was hired in Guthrie, but had not taken over as superintendent. I watched I came to their board meetings and I watched how it worked. And there were questions that were asked during the board meeting that the staff didn't uh, have the information on because they didn't uh, they needed to research it. And they were trying to make the decision at the board meeting, but the research was uh, was going to require time on the staff members part. And so that's why getting this stuff in front of the board members for discussion and dialogue and and input prior to the meeting is key because um, that leads to the next thing. This, this allows for a very smooth flow of the board meetings. And when you, when you watch our board meetings, they generally have a very uh, swift flow to them. And they, uh, everyone, uh, everyone has, it doesn't mean that we don't have discussion but everyone comes in informed that are board members. But that also leads to one thing that I um, that I kind of I I have to um, caution everyone about. I don't want a board meeting to look like it's completely a rubber stamp of what my recommendation is as superintendent. And so occasionally I'll make the comment that we uh, we discussed an item at length in uh, committee meetings. And I may even make a comment about those discussions and the things that were considered so that the public understands that this is not just a rubber stamp, but it has been researched carefully uh, to come to the, the recommendation 
that the board is going to accept that uh, on whatever the issue is. And so those those kinds of things are important because you never want the public to think that the board is only a puppet of the superintendent uh, because that's not a healthy situation either. So then getting to the board retreat, this is a picture from the board uh, retreat that we had on September 25th of 2023. And some of the components, you always want to, I think you want to change the setting. Take everyone away from where it's easy to slip out and not be focused. If you take everyone out of the environment that you're normally in, you tend to have more focus and it helps to really keep everybody's attention because it's going to be a longer, um, it's going to be a longer session than a, than a regular board meeting. And when we do these, it, it resembles a, a more of a committee meeting because it's more discussion. But one of the things that is uh, that is different is it's subject to the open meeting laws. And so we have to uh, we have to follow those and we have to uh, post the agenda and uh, be prepared for, uh, uh, you know, the, the public to to attend, which is fine. We invite that. Uh, the next thing, and this kind of uh, this goes to my uh, uh, church upbringing, I guess, but you always want to feed them. And you want, uh, you know, one of the things that's great about uh, where we ha are able to have ours at our career tech is we have uh, great vendors that can come in and feed them and uh, have an opportunity to, to relax and um break bread together and have relaxed conversation that is um, oftentimes more effective for getting things done. Um, ask for a full day from them. Let them know that you're going to, that this is going to be a full day of work. But in the uh, sense of, we always like the teacher that let us go early. And so if you ask for a full day, but if you let them go early, they walk away feeling as if, um, they got they got done quicker than we expected because they worked so well, and you give them time that they may not have uh, expected. But the other thing is, if you get bogged down and you get in a rut somewhere and you're working to get through some, an issue during the board retreat, it doesn't uh, run over and uh, run into their time that they were un not expected. Um, Expect the media to attend, and and if they show up, feed them as well. You want, uh, and and that's something that I think is very important. That you know, some there are ways that you could have a board retreat and do it in executive session, but I don't think that that is a uh, I don't think that's a best practice unless it's something that is a very um, difficult topic that has to be confidential. And that's where you foster transparency. Uh, when I when I was uh, first hired here, the uh, community had the impression that the school district had been hiding things from the from the community. I don't know that that was really the case, but I think that was the perception. Uh, soon after um, we uh, um, Soon after I was hired, we began publishing the entire board packet with all supporting documents on our website uh, so that anybody can can view whatever's going to be discussed at the at the board meeting, along with all supporting documents. And this was kind of in the transition when a lot of boards, a lot of schools were going to um, paperless board meetings and, and things like that. And we we kind of led the way in that in a sense, because we wanted to have all of the information available for a public. And it has, um, what what I've found is that people, when you're willing to put that out there, people are going to trust you and have more trust in your uh, ability to, to serve the community uh, because you're not hiding anything. Uh, 
more on the board retreat here. The one of the things that I talk about there, and and I want to always bring up, is communication practices, uh, communication between the board and the superintendent, and between the superintendent and the community. I want input from the board about how I should communicate with them and how they should communicate with me, but also on their uh, evaluation of how I'm communicating with the community and the input that I'm receiving from the community as well. Uh, next, we always try to have a policy discussion. And uh, when, you, when you look at uh, the... Our policies, so many of them are driven by mandates or directives from the state legislature. And so we generally about uh, in August is generally the time that we, July and August are, are the times that we start looking very carefully at uh, policy changes. And if you notice that board retreat that we had was in September. But I always want, while it may be uh, produced largely by the uh, uh, a product of, the, uh, of things handed down from the state legislature. I want input from the board if there are policies that they would like to see that we don't have. Um, one of the major key functions of a board member is, um, is to, to develop policy. And they rely on the, me as the superintendent to lead them in that discussion, but I also want their input. Uh, the next, I don't think you can have a, a deep dive into your school district without discussing academic growth updates and initiatives. And I think that's a critical part. And, and you're, you have to have that discussion uh, anytime that you get together um, in, a, in a setting like this. And then I always ask them, I, I, I bring up, do you like the committee structure? I ask them and I want input. Do you want to continue to uh, have the committees? The, the answer has always been yes in the 12 years that I've been here starting year 13. But I always ask the question because I think it's, um, it's something that we're asking of their time. But And I want to make sure that they have value in it. And I, if they're not getting something out of it, what changes do we need to make so that they can? And I think that's a that's a critical part of that as well. And then uh, phone calls or emails to and from board members. Uh, I I talk a little bit about how we are, are going to communicate, and um, one of the things that I always try and remind them and. Many people will, many superintendents will tell you this, but if you have a, a board member that, you know, you know, I've got a, I've got a crisis on our hands that I'm calling the board members to let them know about. And I place the phone call and uh, I'm explaining the crisis and, and getting an input from them and things like that. And then it turns to, from the board member, well, as long as I've got you on the phone. And I remind the board members that if I have seven calls to make and it's five minutes a piece and it's a crisis, and then all seven of them go, well, as long as I've got you on the phone, we've now doubled or tripled the amount of time it takes for me to make those phone calls. And in many cases, the crisis may be over uh, before I can uh, uh, get everything out to them. And, uh, and, you know, most of the time it's the phone call is made after the fact, after we've handled a crisis or whatever, but they will happen. That's, that's what happens in a school district. And so making those and reminding them, that, hey, shoot me an email, come in and talk and grab some coffee with me uh, in the morning and let's talk about it. Um, but while I'm making these phone calls, time is of the essence. And then um, then letting them know that 
you know, I'm going to send you emails. I'm going to give you updates when I think it's necessary. Some superintendents have a weekly um, uh, newsletter that they send to their board members. I've I've done that before, but I, I try to make it now more uh, about when they see an email from me, they know it's significant and uh, to make sure that they they look it over. And if it's something that I've sent them an email that is critical and time sensitive, I'll send them the email and then I'll text them. Hey, you've got an email. I need to hear from you uh, as as quickly as possible, please, about your thoughts on this or give me a call. And, and that's something that I'll I'll just highlight the importance of that email. So turning to the media. Um, because that's something that is, uh, and this is all part of communication with the board members. Uh, my goal is to inform the board members, either through email, phone call, text message, whatever, before we're on the news at, at 10 o'clock or 5 o'clock. Uh, let them hear our side of what it is. It may be something I can tell them. It may be something I can't tell them but let them know what's going on, what we have done, and give them uh, the, the amount of information that I can give them before they see it on the news. Because they will, uh, when they see it on the news, so will their neighbors, and so will the people they see in the grocery store and everything else. And so they've got to be the expert on it, on what they can talk about. And, you know, the I go back to, I think it was my second year, um, as superintendent, I, at, at 10 o'clock, there was a news, uh, story about one of our teachers that I had no idea was happening. And, uh, and it was, it was not a good situation. And, um, I know how that feels. And I don't want, uh, when I went through that as superintendent, I certainly don't want our board members to go through that as as well, if it can be avoided. Um, the we, we operate under the premise that the superintendent is the ultimate spokesperson for the district. Some school districts have a media specialist, whether they be contracted or, um, or somebody that is on staff. We actually contract with someone for some of that work, but normally, um, I am the spokesperson, and so the, the superintendent has to accept that. And even if you have a media specialist, ultimately um, you are the you are the spokesperson. One of the things I've learned about me dealing with the media is press releases are best when possible. You control the narrative, you provide the information. Um, you don't. It's not a question and answer session. Uh, you don't have to, you give them the information that you can, but you are not giving them any more and they're not asking for it. So you're not, you're not denying them access when you give a press release. Um, if you give an in-person interview, um, always, always assume that you're being recorded. So um, I've had several, um, many times that the media has come into my office or into our boardroom for me to give an interview. As soon as that camera is in your office, whether it's out of its bag or not, assume that it's recording. So whatever the small talk and things that, that maybe the reporter is going to bring up, um, just assume that all of that is being recorded. And so be... Uh, be on your uh, be on your guard about what you're saying and and not providing any confidential information or anything that is um, that that could cast the district or yourself in a negative light. And then just give the facts you can legally provide. Uh, I sometimes we want to tell more because we know more, but legally and ethically we shouldn't. And um, it, that's why press releases are better as well, because um, reporters are good at getting you to feel comfortable and getting you to share information that maybe you shouldn't. So then let's turn to social media. And I've, um, 
I found this, you know, the George Bernard Shaw quote, never wrestle with pigs. You both get dirty and a pig likes it. And so that's my, that's my thought on social media sometimes. And, but you have to get out in front and create the narrative with positive posts. And, and that is not just one person's job. Um, I always ask our staff to share great things that are going on in their district so that they can, um, so that we can share that, share that with me or share that with my assistant so that we can get the, the good news out of the things that we're doing. And uh, that a lot of times will uh, really get in the way of the negative folks. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do with our board meeting agendas is we try to highlight some accomplishments of a student early on in the agenda. And in many cases, it, um, we have a public comment section in our uh in our agenda. And, and it, sometimes when people are not happy with the district, they want to come share their thoughts, which uh, we allow. But we also try to have the positive things first, uh, because it really changes the, the temperature in the room. And if you see a concerning post, uh, you know, and, I, and I've seen this before, where I, I read something, somebody's claiming this or that or whatever. I'll screenshot it i'll text it off to a staff member and i go you know you may want to look into this and just see what's going on uh because uh, somebody saying this you know it, it doesn't drive us but but if somebody's saying that publicly um uh, are they more than a keyboard warrior or uh and and you know do is this something that we really need to look into because regardless of what's on social media is this something that is that negatively impacts our students? Uh, kind of going back to the cartoon, never getting a back and forth online and encourage board members to avoid as well. Uh, you know, board members are when they when they take ownership of the school district, they want to defend everything. And uh, and you know, I I had a back and forth a, a few years back where I, I looked back on it and thought, you know, I shouldn't have done that. I should have left that alone. Remind board members to do the same thing too and and walk away. Uh, and it's hard. I mean, it, it really is. But uh, but that goes back to um, the, the back and forth you're going along with is probably somebody that wants you to do that. And then this is an interesting one. Um, if you see misinformation, use caution about it. What appears to be misinformation, you probably need to investigate because I, I've had some times where I saw something online and I'm going, no, we didn't do that. That didn't happen. And then upon further review, as the official would say, um, yeah, we really did. And so stepping out there and denying something when you're not sure uh, is probably not a good practice. And so using some caution there is is really uh, important and then investigate and then figure out the, how to go forward with it. Trust, important part of this. Um, having frank discussions with your board about some realities of your community um, having frank discussions about um, staff sometimes and their capabilities. Uh, and, and then this kind of goes into the next one, admitting mistakes. I have had to walk into um, an evaluation meeting one time and started off with, uh, and this was uh, behind closed doors, but I started off with saying, guys, I have screwed up and this is what I have done. Um, and I think that goes a long way toward earning their respect uh, as board members uh, of the superintendent. And it, it's, it's a, that's part of shouldering leadership, in my opinion. And then acknowledging uh, your shortcomings. 
I tell our board when we go to hire a member, a new member of our leadership team, I want somebody that's good at the things that I'm not good at. I want to build a team. I don't want to build people around me that are um, that are similar to me. I want them to complement. I want all of us to complement each other. And then understanding roles, and that's the role of superintendent, understanding the role of the board members. Um, the next is deliverables. Uh, we have goal setting, setting every year. And uh, I think that's important that and we'll and I'll, let me get through this, and then I'll I'll get, kind of package all of this one together. Evaluations, um, you know, you can do an annual or a semi-annual or quarterly, but um, we do quarterly. Uh, I think an annual. I've heard those termed as autopsies sometimes by a, a superintendent. A semi-annual, you could be, you know, you and the board could be you know, not on the same page and not realize it till halfway through the year. Quarterly allows you to have a frank discussion uh, on a regular basis about the direction that you're headed. And let me go back here. Uh, but also with these evaluations, I send out a reminder because the first evaluation, we discuss the district goals for the coming year. And I send that out for each evaluation and remind the board members of what that is. And so, and, and Gary, I'll give you this, uh, obviously I'll give you this presentation so that you can share it with anyone that wants to. And I've got my contact information here, but this is a list of the goals that we, uh, myself as the superintendent and the board agreed upon for the last, for last school year. And I want everybody to kind of see what they are because I think it will provide a, uh, a framework for where our district is. And these are very specific to the district. And then onboarding a new board member. I've got, always got a book assignment for a new board member. Um, I've got an orientation that I do. Then our state school board association also has training. And Excuse me, we've had a very, um, our board has been very stable, but um, but we also, uh, when we have a new board member, I want to make sure that they are comfortable for that first board meeting. And so the book assignment. I found this book uh, my first year at, at the uh, AASA conference, How to Not Be a Terrible School Board Member. And it has, uh, it has, it's just filled with case studies of what the board member's role is, what the school, what the superintendent's role is. And I have, um, I've read this book, I don't know how many times I give it to every board member. I ask them to read it, assume that they do anyway. And, uh, and it is a, is a really good read and you can get this on Amazon. Um, and then on my orientation, um, this is uh, an agenda from, from a most recent board meeting orientation. Some of these items on here are on every for every board member, and then some of them are specific for where we are with the current uh, state of our district. And so you can see, um, I go over the committee structure like I've covered already in this, uh, in this presentation. I talk about board meetings, uh, the Open Meeting Act, a lot of these things. Uh, talk about my communication preferences, ask them what theirs are, um, discuss personnel issues, and uh, then kind of go into a, a not terribly deep dive into budget and finance because otherwise their their eyes are going to roll in the back of their head. And then uh, talk about in this agenda the, the things that are um, pressing right now in our district. And so I take, uh, it's about an hour and a half that I take. I present them with their book and, and encourage them. Um, the way, in many cases, uh, the election for a board member in Oklahoma, uh, in this case, the board member filed and was unopposed. So they were, um, they knew in January that they were going to be 
the next board member, but they were not seated until April. So I encourage them to attend committee meetings. They're not a board member yet, so they don't, they're not a part of the uh, establishing a quorum. And they, uh, and I encourage them to attend board meetings. And uh, so that they can kind of see what's going on and feel more comfortable when they step into the chair. And then our state school board association, this is their most recent uh, new board member training as well. And it happens shortly after the first board meeting that a, a new board member will take on. And uh, so that's, that's how we onboard a, a board member. And then the next part of this, uh, the next uh, getting close to the, to the finish line here, talking about community involvement. Um, I, I think it's key. I think it matters. Uh, in many cases, the school superintendent may be one of the most prominent, uh, visible members of the community, depending on the size of your town. And so with that comes some, uh, some expectations. Uh, I want to be genuinely involved to develop relationships in our community. And I, that's one of the things that has made a difference, I think, is that, uh, my family is here. We, our kids are in school here. My wife also works in the district. We're invested in the community. We're at uh, um, we're at community events. Um, you know, taking uh, taking cues from the board on where to focus in the community, knowing where you need to spend your time uh, on things that matter as you represent the the district. And and your board members, in many cases, have been in the community longer than you have. And so they'll know. So listen to them on that. And relationships build trust. And that's beyond the board. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, high quality relationships that, uh, that have been built in this community. But that, that happens over time. It doesn't happen immediately. And so that's, uh, that's the next thing. And then, then the last point, uh, don't expect to change the world in your first year. It's a profession that, in many cases, uh, people move along, move through quickly, and people that have lived in your community for a long time may be skeptical of how long you'll be there as well. Um, I I face that uh, on a on a continual basis, and then you know we kind of looked up and we'd been here ten years, and now we're starting year thirteen, and so that's all part of the uh, of the uh, building the trust and getting, having people get to know you. So uh, that is, that's my presentation. I, here's my um, email address uh, and I will share the, uh, the presentation with Gary. And uh, so if anyone wants it, you're more than welcome to it or feel free to email me as well. Um, you know, I hope that this uh, I hope that this helps others to uh, look at a potential framework to uh, generate longevity. Thank you so much, Superintendent Simpson. Th this was a very comprehensive, detailed discussion about communication with the board, and and I, I imagine whoever's listening to this, you've, you've gathered a lot of really great details and frameworks on how to how to best communicate. So this is this has been truly amazing. So Superintendent Simpson, thank you so much for this presentation today. Thanks, Gary. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. And look forward to hopefully having you on here again. Uh, we are going to take a quick break. We do want to give a shout out to our sponsor before we take our break, Ideal Impact. Ideal Impact is giving away hundreds of millions of dollars to public education. So if your district needs unrestricted funds to be used for anything, higher teacher salaries or whatever your district needs, reach out to Ideal Impact. And for those that, that for those of you that have been tuning in, we're just going to take a short break and we'll have our next presentation here shortly. <laughs> 